Hi there and welcome to Basar Christian Church. We're glad that you're here and hope that you're ready to encounter God's love as we share from the Word today. And if you're new to Bayside, a very special welcome to you. Be sure to click on the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can keep up to date with all of our videos and messages. And feel free to like, share and comment as you listen to today's sermon. Now let's get straight into it. God is so good. Well, the month of December is Good News Month. So that's our theme for the month is good news. So today we're going to talk about realising the good news and how the message of Jesus first came. And uh, Luke chapter 2, I just want to read some verses here because it's really important to understand the background of uh, um, the Christmas season. Luke 2 verse 1 says, During those days, the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, ordered that the first census be taken throughout his empire. Quinius was the governor of, of uh, Syria at that time. Everyone had to travel to the hometown of their family to complete the mandatory census. So Joseph and his wife Mary left Nazareth, a village in Galilee, and gen- journeyed to their hometown in Judea to the village of Bethlehem, King David's ancient home. They were required to register there since they were both direct descendants of David. Mary was pregnant and nearly ready to give birth. When they arrived in Bethlehem, Mary went into labor and there she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped the newborn baby in strips of cloth and Mary and Joseph laid him in a feeding trough since there was no available space in any upper room in the village. That night, in a field near Bethlehem, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God and the shepherds were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I've come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it's for everyone, everywhere. Wow, that's good news, hey? For today in Bethlehem, a rescue or saviour was born for you. He is Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognise him by this miraculous sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in the feeding trough. Then all at once in the night sky, a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven, and they all praised God singing. That would have been a choir and a half, eh? Glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is peace and a good hope given to the sons of men. When the choir of angels disappeared and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go, let's hurry and find this word who is born in Bethlehem. And see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So they hurried off and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a feeding trough or a manger. Upon seeing this miraculous sign, the shepherds recounted what had just happened. Everyone who heard the shepherd's story was astonished by what they were told. But Mary treasured all these things in her heart and often pondered what they meant. The shepherds returned to their flock ecstatic over what had happened they praised God and glorified him for all they had heard and seen for themselves just like the angel had said now we read this story we've sung the Christmas carols and uh, we've read the story books and we've seen the nativity scenes but sometimes we miss some of the incredible treasures that actually were going on here the amplified version of verse 10 says do not be afraid for behold I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people for this day in the city of David there was born to you a saviour who is Christ the Lord the Messiah now Nazareth that's where they lived is taken from a Hebrew word for branch God controls all events proven by the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem even though his parents were living in Nazareth So the governor decided to have a census and they had to go back to their hometown. That's how they ended up. Jesus wasn't born in Nazareth. As it was prophesied, he would be born in Bethlehem. So the governor decided to call a census. Sometimes things happen, appear random, but God's still in charge. And boy, we need to know that today, that he's still greater than any politician, any nation, any person. God is still greater. Because the Romans, they weren't godly leaders at all, far from it. But if God needed a prophecy fulfilled, he would just organise it. 
So we need to be, not be afraid of the present or the future if we trust in him. And uh, Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Wow, so that was a prophecy in Micah 5.2. The distance from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 105 kilometers. That's a long way to walk or on horseback when you're pregnant. This was a journey and a half for them. It would have taken a, a number of days for them to arrive. Bethlehem or Bethlehem means house of bread, the prophesied birthplace of Messiah. However, the Hebrew word lechem is a Honeman for fighter or warrior. So Jesus was born in the house of fighters. Bethlehem is the city of David who was one of the greatest fighters in the entire Bible. Perhaps this is why the people of Jesus' day expected him to fight the Romans and free them, free their land from foreign occupation. Remember the disciples say, when's it going to happen? And when he talked about his kingdoms of this, not of this world... And even after he rose again, they said, are you going to, now, now that you're back from the dead, is now you're going to throw the Romans out? They still, that was their whole expectation of the Jewish people. And Jesus did not fulfill that because he said, my kingdom's not of this world. And it took them a while to grasp that. Jesus fulfilled both aspects of the meaning of Bethlehem in Gethsemane on, and on the cross, where he fought the Goliath of our souls and won, becoming bread for the world. So it was a house of bread and a house of warriors, and he fulfilled both of them in Bethlehem. Verses 6 and 7, it says, There was no room in the inn. And we have all sorts of pictures of what that means. This is the Greek word, kataluma. This is not an inn, but simply the upstairs level of a home where guests would stay. So it was the guest room upstairs. It means there was no guest rooms available in Bethlehem for Mary to give birth. Since all of Joseph's and Mary's family also made the journey because of the census, so have a think about this, all of their families would have been in Bethlehem at the same time because they had to go there for the census. I'd never thought about that before, but that's true. So every home of the relatives would have been full. In that day, Bethlehem was far too small of a village to have an actual inn or motel. All of the Cataluma there were occupied. It is likely that Joseph and Mary had to sleep downstairs in the main room of a relative's house. The downstairs of a village home in that day was like an all-purpose room that served as a workshop during the day and at night it was used to shelter frail animals while the rest of the flock was left outdoors. The Cataluma was not a full-fledged barn or stable, but it did, did contain a drinking trough or manger cut into the bedrock. This was the likely place where the baby Jesus was placed after his birth. I thought it's fascinating when you get the background of what actually happened. And some of our songs and our Sunday school storybooks do the best they can but sometimes they haven't really studied what actually happened. Verse 8, it says, Many scholars believe that, that, these same, that the, the same fields where the shepherds were were the fac sacrificial flocks where the sheep were kept for temple worship. How fitting that these shepherds would hear the announcement of the birth of of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. So they weren't just normal shepherds, they were looking after the sheep and the lambs that were used as sacrifices for sin in the temple. A baby lying in a feeding trough where animals were kept nearby, wrapped in strips of cloths, became a sign of the man saviour's life on earth. He entered the world as a lowly baby, and though he is the mighty God, he lived his life on earth in gentleness before all. 
The shepherds that night were possibly near Bethlehem at Migdal Elder, the watchtower of the flock. This would fulfill both the prophecies of Micah chapter 5 verse 2 and Micah 4 verse 8, which say, To you he will come, your dominion or kingdom from old will arrive. It was at the lower floor of the watchtower, Migdal Elder, that the birthing of the Passover lambs would take place. Selected ewes that were about to give birth would be brought there. After the birth of the lambs, the priestly shepherds would wrap the lambs in cloth and lay them in a manger lined with soft hay to prevent them from hurting themselves. For Passover lambs must be unblemished with no bruise or broken bones. The miracle sign for those priestly shepherds would be a baby boy lying where the Passover lambs should be in a manger wrapped in strips of cloth. It was at the cradle of Jesus Christ that the kingdom from ancient times arrived on earth. Wow, when I read that, I thought, now it makes sense. Because it says, the shepherds, the angel said to the shepherds, this will be a miracle sign for you. So when they went and saw Jesus wrapped in a cloth in the place where the Passover lambs were placed, they got so excited and that's why they ran through the streets telling everyone the Messiah has been born. They knew it wasn't just a baby in any random manger. That was the sign for them and they said, he's here, he's arrived. The Messiah has been born. They were so incredibly excited because they understood all that I just read to you. And I'd never understood this until recently. I've been a Christian for 48 years. My spiritual birthday was a few days ago. And I thought, wow, I've never understood that before. Now it makes sense. And I want to encourage you, God's in control. And if he could organize for him to have to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem and organize that also the shepherds, the, the, the priestly shepherds were probably the only ones who understood what this meant. And that's why they got so excited. The miraculous sign that Jesus, the Savior of the world, <coughs> had come. The shepherds realized the good news. Today I want to talk about realizing the good news. The shepherds knew. Mary and Joseph knew the good news because the angel had come to Mary and said, you're going to have baby Jesus, the saviour of the world. A while later the wise men came with their gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So some people realized and recognized from day one who Jesus was but lots of people didn't and there's still many people don't today but we who know who he is we need to be like those shepherds saying hey this is true let's shout it let's declare it let's live it because Jesus has come to be the lamb of God to take away the sins of the whole world this is good news for everyone everywhere Hallelujah, that's what we need to live with that. Don't be ashamed to sing these carols. Don't be ashamed to speak the good news because it is great news for everyone, everywhere. These wise men that came, I read recently, they came from the east and some Bible scholars that have dug in and looked at the history of it, do you know where these wise men came from? They believe they were descendants of Daniel and the enchanters from the book of Daniel, who, who were, knew the times and seasons, and so they believe that it was passed down, the, uh, the spiritual intelligence and anointing that was on Daniel to read dreams and understand the future, they believe these wise men came generations before from the, that deposit of the Holy Spirit. When you start to look at the Bible, it all makes incredible sense. 
when you understand a little bit more of the background and history. I thought, Lord, you are incredible. You're amazing. Another thing is God's always on time. We often think he's late. God, I've been praying about this for six months. Where, why haven't you broken through yet? God, I've been leaving for five years. It still hasn't happened. God is always on time. The Bible says that the, the Jews would be t- taken to Egypt. It said they would be there for 430 years. If you read the story of the Exodus, they left Egypt to the very day of 430 years. And sometimes we get upset saying, God, you've forgotten me and, and you're, not, you're too late. No. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, But when the time of fulfillment had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, yet all of this was so that he would redeem and set free those held hostage to the law, so that we would receive our freedom and a full legal adoption as his children. And just leave that up there for a moment. Every child has a mother, but for Jesus to be born of a woman meant there was no human father, no male counterpart. Because the baby Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit supernaturally, and she gave her a virgin birth. I just love the word because it all ties together when we see it. Jesus, the Father, is the Father of eternity. No other child has had a virgin birth, born of a woman except Jesus. All the rest of us are born from a father and a mother. The Amplified says, But when in God's plan the proper time had fully come. And for those that have studied history, Bible history, the Romans took over who were cruel dictators, but what they did, they brought relatively pe- relative peace over the whole Middle East. They set up roads and languages and systems so that when Jesus was born, the message could spread all over the known world. Before that, countries didn't connect very well. There was no means of getting the message out. So God allowed what we would see as something that was not good to prepare the way for Jesus to be born. We need to think about that in the light of the craziness that's happening in our world, that God always has greater plans. The devil has schemes to destroy, but God has plans to bless. And if you trust in God, God's plans will always overcome the devil's schemes. We've just got to be confident about that, even in our present crazy world we live in God sent his son born of a woman born under the regulations of the law Jesus came to fulfill all the law and the prophets he didn't come to destroy him he came to fulfill them that's why you see the Passover lamb and all these other parts that fulfilled all the Old Testament preparation getting people ready for the coming of Jesus but a lot of people missed it Anyone's been watching the Chosen series, the poor old Pharisees and religiously, they just missed it by a country 100 kilometers, you know, they just just couldn't see it. And even the disciples, they were with Jesus for three, three and a half years and at the end they still only had half the message. Are you going to overthrow the Romans now? They thought he was going to set up the kingdom of David and have blessing and prosperity. But God says, no, no, there's a a greater plan here than what you see with your natural eyes. But I believe the Holy Spirit will always reveal to the prophets. He will reveal to the people of light so that we're never caught out. And some people get concerned about when's Jesus going to come? Are we going to know all the signs? There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians says, we are not as people of the dark, we are people of the light. And if you are in the light, he will show you what's coming next. So it's on a need-to-know basis that the Spirit of God will show us what our part individually and corporately as the body of Christ is in this crazy time we're in. I live with that quiet but very strong confidence in my heart and then he shows us what our part is to walk through this season, this journey. So Jesus, he was revealed as the Messiah, 
the saviour of the world to many people. What about when he was revealed to the Samaritan woman at the, at the well? Wow. She was one of the first ones that Jesus declared that wasn't a Jew, wasn't one of his inner circle, that he was the Messiah. I'll give you living water that you'll never thirst again. And then he shared with her and he said, I am the Messiah. She got so excited, she took that news, ran back to her hometown, told everyone, and the indication is that the whole town came out to hear Jesus. He then went back to that town, it says, for several days, and many people came to follow Jesus as the Messiah. Because one person had the revelation from Jesus. She realized and recognized who he was. And uh, last Sunday I was sharing about the, uh, the blind man in John chapter 9. And Jesus revealed to him that he was the Messiah and the Savior. In Peter, Matthew in 16, Jesus said, who do people say I am? And they said, John the Baptist, a prophet, a great teacher. But then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? It gets a bit challenging when Jesus starts saying, well, who do you? Yeah, I, it's nice to talk about what Bible scholars and pastors and preachers and what everyone else says. But who do you say I am? That's when it gets a little bit personal, when, when Jesus says, am I your Lord and Saviour? Do you trust in me with all your heart? Jesus has a way of just getting to the heart. And he loves us, and he gets to the heart. And so we see many millions of people have realised that Jesus is the Saviour of the world, but many people still see Jesus as a religious prophet, a great teacher, a revolutionary leader, a historical figure, or romantically a baby in a manger, but they don't see him as their saviour and Lord. And as we come into this Christmas season, I want us to share the good news. I want us to know it ourselves with fresh revelation and understanding that he is our saviour. Who do you see that Jesus is? Is he your saviour, your Lord, your king, your friend? John 3.16 in the Passion says, for here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in me will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world and judge it, but to be the saviour and rescue it. So many people feel condemned and judged by God. Jesus said, that's not what I came to do. Most of that comes from ourselves, from other people, or from the lies from the pit of hell. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge and condemn, I come to save and rescue. And we, that's, the, that's the good news we need to be sharing, as Peter was sharing. It's about what God's for, not what he's against. Because if you get the for right, the against stuff gets dealt with. And yes, we need to repent, and we need to walk away from our old life, but it's only as we understand the revelation of love and power of the gospel that we can do that. And that's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worship team, come on up. Isaiah 9, 9, 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. Wow, no end. So the plans of God will always overcome the schemes of the devil. Personally, corporately, nations and the world. And that's what we learn through Jesus. Matthew 4.23, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The good news is when Jesus is allowed to function and flow and we by faith connect and trust him, anything's possible. Healing, forgiveness, breakthrough, transformation, hope in the midst of darkness, light and transformation. And today, no matter where you are, I want to say Jesus has come to be the Savior of the world. He has come. We see that throughout the Scriptures. And we need to realize, recognize it, and live in the blessing and power of it. Let's stand in His presence today. 
I'll finish with the verse I started. Luke 2, 10 says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Who do you say that I am? Thank you for connecting with us at Bayside Christian Church. If you receive something from today's message, don't stop there. We release sermons every week to help you connect to God's Word. If you made a faith response, have a prayer request or even just a question, we'd love for you to get in touch with us. You can connect with us by checking out the link in the below description for our social links and contacts. We hope you encounter God's love, connect with the Word and feel that you belong in the Bayside family. God bless you.